usually when we sing that hymn um, or a baptismal <coughs> hymn, you, you'll expect that there are going to be a couple of people up here at the baptismal funds and they're going to be undergoing a baptism or, or, or bringing a child for baptism. No, no baptism today, although I thought there, there might be, um, but the timing was not quite right. But um, in the gospel lesson from this morning, Jesus is approached by a man who wants to know how he gets to heaven. And Jesus says you can't get to heaven unless you're reborn. And, and, and he couldn't understand that. He couldn't grasp that. What do you mean? I'm supposed to go into my mother's womb again and actually come out from the birth canal and be born again? And, and, and Jesus says, no, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. He says, there's faith involved. And that, that's a regeneration, a rebirth. Born physically and then born spiritually. And, and, and that's how a person gets into, be, into being one of God's family. This morning, we're going to be focusing on just that. And the fact that you don't get into heaven by knowing somebody or by by being a part of a certain family, but it's by faith, and, and that's always something that we need to be reminded of and, and and remembering because that faith is something that is so precious to us. It needs to be nurtured. It needs to be fed. It needs to be um, nourished as we grow in our lives. We'll begin by using the order of service on the screen or in your bulletins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purifies us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature, and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment, O now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord, Lord have mercy. Help, save. Comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you see that we have no power to defend ourselves. Guard and keep us both outwardly and inwardly from all adversities that may happen to the body and all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <coughs> the first reading for the second Sunday in Lent is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 12. The first eight verses in the second lesson, which will also be our, our sermon text for this morning, Paul comments on what we hear in this first lesson about Abraham. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. 
So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tents with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm for this morning is Psalm 121. After the organist introduces it, we'll sing the song and the refrains together. Not only to those who are of the law, 
but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please stand.
Amen. The text for this morning is, is taken from the second reading, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, and then kind of leaning on the Old Testament, because the Old Testament gives us some background about who Paul was talking about in the second lesson. Dear, dear brothers, your sisters in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, have you ever had a family member who set the bar really high for you or for everybody else after that person? Who, who was just extremely lust, extremely talented, and, and, and they kind of had a, a legacy that you, you wonder if you could ever live up to that person in your family. Back in the day, it was the first person who got to go to college. The first person who was college educated, the first person who might have graduated from college. That was the person that everybody looked up to in the family. If you're old and you watch old TV shows in the 1970s, you think of maybe the, the, the Waltons. Who was the person who set the bar really high in the Walton family? John Boy. First person to go to college in his family. First person to graduate from college. Everybody, and there were actually some episodes that talked about how some of the younger siblings, they didn't like it that John Boy had set the bar so high and that they were expected to live up to it. Or, or maybe you've got a brother or sister who, who has a, a, a record still at that school for most points scored, most goals scored, <clears throat> most blocks, most steals, what have you, in a certain year, the fastest time in, in a track meet. And it still stands. They have their name somewhere in the school building, maybe under glass. And, and you think, I just wish I could be like my brother, or I wish I could be like my sister. I wish I could be as good as they were. Maybe you've got someone in the family who was a, a military veteran, and they served in World War II or, or, or Vietnam or Korea, and, and, and they won maybe a, a medal, a silver star, medal of honor, something, what have you. And, and, and every time that you get together for Veterans Day or, or some kind of like family get-together, you, you talk about this person, whether they're still alive or, or whether they're already gone. Because they set the bar really, really high, and their legacy is huge. And you wonder if you could ever even be close <coughs> to that person. For the Jewish people, you know who that person was? who set the bar really, really high, and who always everybody looked up to? It's Abraham. You go back to the, the book of Romans, you see Abraham talked about all the time by Paul, a, a Jewish person who looked back at Abraham, and he, and he compared people's life to Abraham. Go back to Genesis, up to Genesis chapter 25, or, or thereabouts, and you see the whole Bible is, is really focused on <coughs> Abraham and Abraham's line. The patriarchs, the family that God has said, you are going to be a blessing for the whole world. I'm going to bless your descendants. You're going to be huge in numbers. It was Abraham. He was the father of the Jewish people. If you want to compare it to somebody now, it would be like George Washington, sometimes known as what? The father of our country. Why? Well, Revolutionary War hero. Continental Congress. First President of the United States, two-term President of the United States. Everybody looks up to him. There's so much written about George Washington that sometimes you wonder, and so much good written about George Washington, you wonder, could this all be this guy? Could this guy be so good in his life? It's, it's almost the stuff of, of, of legends or, or fables. Could he live up to that legacy himself? For America is George Washington, for Israel, for the Jewish people, it's Abraham. And it's always been Abraham, and it doesn't take too long to figure out why he was Abraham for the Jewish people. Go back to the first lesson. Go, go back to how, how, how Moses writes about Abraham. 75 years old. We have anybody here that's like 75 years old, near boats? Ralph? <laughs> Anybody else? Rich? Jerry? Imagine if God would call to you some night and say, I want you to pack up everything. 
all your possessions, and you follow me. I'm not going to tell you where you're going to go, but I just want you to follow me. And, and you follow me until I tell you that this is where your new home is going to be. And you actually did it. That was the faith of legends. That was the stuff of legends. And, and so Abraham did. He packed up everything. He, he followed God's call. He ended up in Canaan. The, the Canaanites were still in the land. Not too long after that was what? God promised a second time. He says, all nations are going to be blessed through you. And Abraham says, but I don't have any children. Not of my own, my own offspring. God says, don't worry, you will. And Abraham says, I'm 75 years old. Don't people at that point cease to have any hope of, of children? But God says, all people will be blessed through one of your children. You will have children. And Abraham believed. There were some ups and downs in that faith, some doubts and some wavering, but he believed. And close to 100, he became the father of Isaac. Fast forward another several years into Isaac's teens. God called Abraham again. He says, Abraham, you know that son of yours that I gave you in your old age, the one that you love, your only son, the one that you dearly, dearly love. I want you to take him to Mount Moriah, and I want you to sacrifice him. And what did Abraham do? I'm sure in his mind he was he was having some, some questions and some mental gymnastics like, you want me to do what, Lord? <coughs> but the Bible tells us that very early the next morning, he followed God's directive. And he took Isaac as the sacrifice. He didn't bring a sacrifice. He took him to Mount Moriah. And in his mind, the New Testament tells us, Abraham did, in fact, sacrifice his son Isaac on the altar there that they had built on Mount Moriah. Remember how God had stopped Abraham from actually sacrificing him physically. But the New Testament is very clear. In his mind, Abraham did it. He killed his son because that's what God was leading him to do. It's no surprise then that Jewish people would refer to Abraham as the father of nations, the father of the Israelites. They, they didn't even talk about themselves as connected to their own father as much as they did no, we're the children of Abraham, no matter how many generations were in between. And they were proud of that connection. They were proud. They, they wore it as a badge of honor on themselves. We are children of it. Do you know that my ancestors, I can direct, I can follow my line directly back to Abraham. Now, at this point, I hope that you're thinking, but who cares? Because you know the Bible well enough that it doesn't matter. And you've heard enough Bible teaching and sermons that it doesn't matter at all who you are connected to when it comes to your salvation. It doesn't matter if you are related to anybody. Your faith is not dependent on somebody else. Your faith and your hope of heaven, your confident hope of heaven, is based on what God has born in you. Your faith. John the Baptist, before Christmas, we heard this. Don't think that you can say to yourselves, he was talking to the Pharisees, we have Abraham as our father. God could raise up children for Abraham out of these stones that are in front of us. In other words, if the Jewish people thought that having an ancestor like Abraham was going to do them any good, when it, come to, when it came to their hope of heaven, they were sadly mistaken. It's not your connections. It's not who you know when it talks about you're getting to heaven. If anything, if, if you're talking about, you know, look, this person was in my past. <clears throat> I'm connected to this person. And I've had this conversation more than once. It almost makes some people start to despair over any hope that they might get to heaven. Why? Because they're trying to compare themselves to this person who they assume is in heaven. And they think, I can't measure up to this person, so why bother? I... I'm never going to be like this person, so, so why bother? Think of someone in your family. Very often it's a grandmother. Grandmother, God-fearing, obedient to God's word and God's will. And, and, and wanting nothing more than to be in church every single Sunday morning, every single time that, that worship was held, that lady was in church. 
Maybe she wanted something else, but that was only that her children and her grandchildren were in church with her on Sunday mornings. But think of that person. You might know somebody like that in your own mind. If there is anybody that should be able to get to heaven, it would be that person. And, and I hope you have somebody in your mind. And you think, I wish I could be like that person. I'm not like that person. I'm not even close to being like that person. And then you start despairing of your salvation. And you wonder, there's questions and doubt that comes to your mind. I don't know that I'm going to be in heaven because I'm not close to them. But then you ask the question, why is Abraham in heaven? Why did God allow Abraham to come into heaven? Was it because he deserved it? Was it because of all the righteous things that he had done, all the good things, the things that he obeyed God in, in his life? Paul writes about that in our text. He says, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter? In other words, how was Abraham saved? He goes on to say, Paul says, If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about. In other words, because he was a good person for the most part. But then Paul quickly rejects that possibility by saying this, but he could not boast before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited, credited to him as righteousness. So whenever the Bible talks about that your, your account has been credited, that reminds us that it's a gift. It's not something that we earned or that we, that we deserve. It's been given to us as a gift. It's been placed there in your account by someone else. And when it comes to faith, it's, of course, it's God. So here, here's the illustration. Say it's payday. And instead of you getting the, the check in the mail or the check in your box at work, the owner comes out and he decides that he's going to give you your check that day. The check that he signed personally, the, the money that's going to come from him and his net worth to pay you. And he makes a big show of it. He says, here's your check. He says, I'm such a wonderful person, in other words. I'm giving you this money out of the goodness of my heart. And what might you be led to think? Wait a second. I earned that money. I was here for 50 hours last week. I am owed that money because when you work for something, you are owed an obligation. You deserve the check. When you don't work for something, then you are not owed it. If anyone is going to get credit for that check, that money that is paid to you, it should be you. But Abraham's righteousness was not something that he earned at all. It was something that he had not deserved at all. Go back to Genesis. Even though his life was pretty good by human standards, he had his ups and downs just like everybody else in this world. The only thing that Abraham deserved from God is what? The wages of sin. And what's the wages of sin? Paul says the wages of sin is death. But that's not what Abraham received. Abraham received life in heaven. Through his faith, the promise of a Savior was credited to him as righteousness. Even though he was not perfect, even though he wasn't wonderful before God in every way, God says, you are going to heaven because of this gift. It comes through faith. Not something that you did or that you earned. It comes freely. That's grace. Just like you and me, your, your life, like my life, would never ever measure up to Abraham's. Your life probably doesn't even measure up to that person that you were thinking about earlier, Grandma, who, who again, God-fearing, obedient, just a perfect person in every respect. Our lives don't measure up to those lives. But if you believe in God's promises, if you trust in the Savior that God sent into this world so that we might not perish but have eternal life, you are going to receive the same gift as Grandma did in heaven or as Abraham did or as anybody else 
who is in heaven already. The holiness and the perfection that God demands from you is given to you through Jesus' death on the cross. It's Christ's righteousness that gets you to heaven, not your righteousness. It's Christ's work, not our earned. And it's guaranteed. As Paul says in the last couple of verses of our text, because Paul says, by faith, we can call Abraham our father as well. And again, not, not because we, we, we wear it as a badge of honor, but we wear the fact that we share the same faith as Abraham did. We don't have the same blood in our veins. We don't have the same DNA in our bodies. But we have the same faith. And that faith is going to get you to heaven someday. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which goes beyond our understanding will guard and keep your hearts and your minds in the true faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess our Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living. Almighty God, we commend to your care also Leroy Schultz and Calvin Eichstadt, recently returned from hospital stays. Thank you for blessing doctors and medical workers with great skills. Bless their work so that your servants may now enjoy relief and recovery from their afflictions. <coughs> with confidence in your faithful love, we, we place them into your hands. O oh God, you looked on humanity when we had fallen to death and resolved to redeem us by giving your only Son. Grant that we may confess him as our Savior and remain in unity with him, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <laughs>
read in the bulletin, and you'll note that this past week as we've been installing our council members, it's due to the fact that schedules are different for everybody. It was impossible to get everybody in the same service. So today we will install for your benefit so that you know who is, is serving you as, as leaders in the congregation, um, Dan and Lester and Keith. Dear friends, in holy baptism, our Lord Jesus Christ set you free from sin and death and has made you members of his body, the church. Through word and sacrament, you have been nurtured in that faith. You have now been selected for positions of service to our Lord on behalf of this congregation. The Lord has entrusted you with an office which you are to carry out as his servants and according to his word. St. Paul wrote concerning service in the church, We all have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. The Lord seeks faithfulness from all who serve. As Scripture says, it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. The Lord has promised to be with you and to give you the gifts that you will need for faithfully carrying out the work entrusted to you. As servants of Jesus Christ and workers in this congregation, you are to be good examples of Christian living for your own families as well as for the whole church. Make the word of God your foundation and guide. Search it daily for comfort and instruction. <coughs> so that this congregation may be assured of your willingness to serve, I ask you in the presence of God in this congregation. Will you diligently and faithfully carry out the work entrusted to you according to the ability that God has given you? If so, then answer together, I will, and I ask God to help me. I will, and I ask God to help me. I know I install you as members of the Church Council of Zion Evangelical Lutheran Church in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Dan Elke, Elders, Lester Hahn, Evangelism, and Keith Bartell, President. <coughs> May God grant you his Holy Spirit and give you wisdom and strength to carry out those duties to his glory and for the good of his people. Now, members of Zion, I urge you to regard these fellow believers as servants of Jesus and God's gifts to his church. Pray for them. Support them in their service so that through the gospel ministry of this congregation, believers may be strengthened in faith and many others may come to know the Savior and the eternal hope that he gives. We pray. Merciful and gracious God, our lives are open before you and you hear our promises. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit into the hearts of these servants, that they may carry out their duties with diligence, boldness, humility, and wisdom. Give them a spirit of devotion and prayer, that in every time of need they may present their request to you. Help them to be examples of what is good, that by their lives they may serve in Christian love and provide the enemies of the church no cause for criticism. Make them a blessing to your believers. Help them to work with their pastor, other congregational leaders, and with one another. Guide and direct them that by their service, the unity of this congregation is strengthened, your name hallowed, your kingdom enlarged, and your will be done. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Go then now and give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is never in vain. The Almighty and merciful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. We'll continue by singing the next hymn.
Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation, and bestow on us your saving peace. For Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.
her in your prayers as well this week. A couple of other things, Lighthouse Youth Center, um, there's not a whole lot signed up for yet, so if you could take a look at that list, and if you could provide any food items that we need, um, that saves us money in buying them ourselves, so the donations would be appreciated. Sign up on the bulletin board, also sign up for the bags tournament. Um, <clears throat> I don't know that there's an official Cornhole King or Cornhole Queen, um, but we can make one. Um, I don't know that that's something that you want to have in that title, um, but, um, but just for the, the benefit of saying, you know what, I'm the best in this creation, or, or I'm the Cornhole King, um, you might want to try that. But it's, it's always a, a lot of fun when we've had those. It's been a lot of fun, a lot of great fellowship, food, um, fun, family-friendly events. We won't get rained out this, this year because we're in the fellowship hall, so that's coming up soon. But the sign-up is on the bulletin board on the in the narthex. And then uh, all the other things you can read for yourselves. God's blessings on your week. <laughs>